Hey guys, it's Kyle here, and in today's C programming tutorial, we're going to be learning all about variables. Today's video is the first in my series of C tutorials in which we'll be able to do actual programming. And I've chosen to start with variables because I think it's a great place to begin with a language like C. Because C requires a lot of um, understanding of how memory allocation works because it's such a low level language. Now this tutorial uh, will go over very briefly some of the memory allocation that happens in C and give you an overview of how computers uh, process numerical data. Because it's, I think it's at least important to understand how C works and it's important to set a foundation for later topics and then I'll go over things like variables and, and their data types naming them etc to frame our discussion today I want to quickly answer the question what is a variable a variable is any piece of data that can be stored in a computer's memory and they don't just exclusively refer to numerical values they could also refer to logical values meaning true or false and even within numbers we have divisions between integers which are whole numbers and floating points which are what we call decimal numbers a variable is your means for symbolically representing some kind of value either numerical or logical within a computer program and variables specific to C will need data types and names and all of that stuff that I'll go over a little bit later in the tutorial. So let's just jump into it right now. And because we're learning about C, there's no better place to start than with memory allocation. The following section will give you a cursory understanding of how computers store data in variables. This isn't totally essential for programming, but I do recommend you understand it because it always helps to be able to understand how something works in order to use it. The first thing that we need to talk about is binary math which is how computers represent numbers. Humans represent numbers using a base 10 or decimal number system. Computers, on the other hand, use a base 2 number system in which numbers are represented using powers of 2. And in case you're rusty on your powers of 2, I put them all up here for reference. Any discussion of computer memory has to start from the bottom up with the bit. The bit is the smallest and most fundamental unit of memory. It's simply a single digit that can have a value of either 0 or 1. One bit on its own is not very exciting. You really can't do much with it. But take a whole bunch of bits and put them together, specifically 8 bits, which forms one byte, and then you start cooking with fire. A byte is composed of 8 individual bits, and each of those bits is a placeholder for a different power of 2. Computers will represent a decimal number, that is a number in our base 10 number system, in this binary system using a collection of bits. Each bit is marked with either a 0 or a 1 to determine whether that specific power of 2 is to be added to create the decimal number. Then all of the powers of 2 that are marked with a 1 are added together and the result is a decimal number. So in other words, the number that we humans would call 35 in our decimal number system would be known as 00100011 to a computer. And if you're not a total nerd like me and you don't want to have to do all of those conversions in your head, there are programming calculator apps on most computers that can do these conversions for you. Realistically, you don't really have to think about binary numbers when you're programming. The reason why I'm teaching you about binary math is because it's important for selecting the correct data type that you want to use when defining your variable. Binary math comes in handy for understanding the maximum value that you can store in a variable of any given data type. And this maximum value is given by 2 to the power of n minus 1 where n is the number of bits that you've allocated for storing data in that variable. So for example, a byte has 8 bits, so the maximum value stored by an unsigned byte would be 2 to the power of 8 minus 1, which is 255. We subtract 1 because 0 is included as a valuable that the variable can store. Otherwise, you would be counting from 1 to 256 as opposed to 0 to 255. Why is this important? That brings us to data types. Everything that I've told you so far has been to frame the foundation for your understanding of data types, which is one of the first really important concepts that you need to grasp as a C programmer. A lot of programming languages don't even ask you to bother with data types, such as Python. C, being a lower level language, forces you to define the data type that each of your variable will be when you declare that variable. C has several different kinds of data types and they each do different things and they're used for different purposes. And each of those kinds of data types can exist in different memory sizes. The first kind of data type that I'm going to go over is the integer type, which is pretty self-explanatory. 
These are used for storing integer values, that is, whole numbers, and they come in several different sizes, which I have shown here. The smallest of the integer type is the byte, which is 8 bits, and it ranges from negative 28 to positive 128 when signed, or when unsigned, which is called a u-byte, it ranges from 0 to positive 255. The next step up is a short, which is 2 bytes. This is also known as a word, which ranges from roughly negative 32,700 to positive 32,700. The next step up from that is the long, also known as the D word for double word, is 4 bytes or 32 bits. And then finally we have the Q word, which means quadruple word, which is 8 bytes or 64 bits. As you can see, as you increase the amount of memory allocated for storing data in a specific variable, the possible size of the numerical data that you can store in that variable increases exponentially. Of course, the trade-off is that this will consume more of your memory, and all of these variables are stored in the computer's RAM, or random access memory. So that's why you need to think about memory allocation, so you don't end up using all of your RAM. One quick little side note, if you're planning to program the EV3 in C, you should know that the EV3 does not support QWORD or any other 64-bit data type because the EV3 itself is only a 32-bit architecture. The next important thing that a C programmer must understand is the difference between signed and unsigned data types. And I briefly mentioned this on the previous slide. Specifically, we're going to be looking at the byte and the u-byte but all of the data types that I mentioned on the previous slide can be either signed or unsigned. A signed byte will range from negative 128 to positive 127, and it includes both positive and negative numbers, and zero. The U byte, on the other hand, or unsigned byte, is only positive numbers and zero. So the U byte has a larger maximum value that it can store, but it only goes in one direction away from zero. It can only handle positive numbers. The trade-off, on the other hand, is that now the byte can do positive and negative numbers, but the magnitude of the maximum value it can store is much smaller. The reason for the difference in the range of values that they can store goes back to what we just learned about binary math. In the unsigned byte, one of those bits is allocated for the sign of the number, either positive or negative. So the signed byte can only range from 0 to positive 127 or negative 128 because it's only using 7 bits for numerical data. The 8th bit is used to store the sign information. So this is a useful thing to keep in mind. For example, if you're only dealing with positive numbers and your maximum value is, say, 150 or 200, then you could use a u-byte as opposed to a standard signed byte. What if you wanted to store numerical data that isn't a whole number or an integer? This is where the floating point data types come in. They're designed to store decimal numbers. The two versions that are most commonly used are the one called float, which is 4 bytes, and there's one called double, which is short for double float, which is 8 bytes, which is larger and more precise than the standard 4 bytes. The floating point data types are more versatile than integer data types because they store both whole numbers and decimals. However, they're less precise and floating points can't always store the exact value. The reason why this happens is because, if you think about it, we're attempting to represent a base 10 decimal number in base 2 binary, which is sometimes impossible to do with exact accuracy. And if you think about it, even our base 10 number system has some limitations. For example, we can't express the fraction 1 third precisely as a decimal. Instead, we have to settle for 0.333, etc., which is really just an approximation of the fraction. So what this means in the context of programming floats is that a lot of times floating point data types will end up with errors in the fifth or sixth decimal place, which can lead to numerical errors that accumulate within your program. And for this reason, if you know you're going to be using exclusively integer values, you would want to use an integer data type, even though the floating point is more versatile. The maximum value that any given floating point variable can store depends on the desired precision that you want. So if you want more precision, that means more places past the decimal, you're going to get a smaller maximum value. The way I thought of it when I first learned is that you have a finite number of significant figures. Within those significant figures, the decimal place can move around or float in between the different digits. And for that reason, it's called a floating point. So you can either have more digits on the left of the decimal place at the expense of the digits on the right, or vice versa. And again, because the EV3 only has a 32-bit architecture, it does not support double floats. Last but certainly not least, we have the logic data type. 
and there's only one of them. It's called the bool. It uses one byte of memory, and its range of values is from zero, which represents a false value, or one, which represents a true value. This is how computers do logic operations, uh, such as Boolean logic, which is where it gets its name from. And Boolean logic is something that I'll cover a little bit later in the series. The use of true-false values is important for control structures, which is also something that I'll be covering later in the series. And because I'm such a nice guy, here's a complete chart of all of the data types we discussed in this video. So you can study it, take a screenshot, print it out, maybe even hang it up on your fridge, frame it, mount it on a wall. Now that we have all of that information out of the way, we can finally go ahead and start defining some variables in C. It's a little bit more involved than it might be with some other programming languages such as Python uh, because there are a, a few extra steps and a few extra things that you have to think about, but really it's still pretty simple. So I'm going to go within task main here and I'm going to hit tab just so I have that nice space there. That just keeps things nice and neat. The first thing you need to do when defining a variable is to tell the compiler what data type that you're going to be using. So I'm going to start with a u byte. Uh, and I'm just going to simply type ubyte, which is the name of the data type, then put a space, and now I need to give my variable a name. So I'm going to name this one Kyle, and finally we need to give it some kind of value. So I can give this a value of, say, 250, and be sure to punctuate that statement with a semicolon, which tells the compiler that you've completed that statement. So now I've created a variable named Kyle, which can be referenced from anywhere inside of task main. And I'll press the compile button, and we'll see that the variable has been created. It's telling me that it's not being read anywhere, obviously because we don't have the rest of the program yet. I'm going to go ahead and show you how to uh, define a few more variables. So I'll go ahead now and I'll make a variable of type byte, and we'll name this one Timmy. And we'll give this a value of, say, negative 35, punctuate that with a semicolon. Now we have another variable that we can use. We'll keep going. I'm going to make a variable of type long for storing larger data. Um, and let's say we'll call this one grunt. And now, what if we don't know what value we want this variable to have at the start of the program? Instead, we want to use this later on where its value will be changed and manipulated, so on and so forth, in another part of the program. That's okay. And what you would do in that case is simply put it equal to zero. And in that case now, we have a variable initialized as grunt. It doesn't have any value yet, but it's ready to go whenever we want to call it later in the program. That brings me to an important point about programming in C, is that all of your variables must be defined like this before you use them in the program. So these three variables are now ready to go, and we can uh, make another operation down later in the program that uses them uh, to change their value. But you need to make sure that the compiler knows that they exist at, at the beginning of the program before moving on um, to where they're used later on. So let's try to make a floating point variable. So we'll have float, uh, we'll call this thundersmart. This will get me to another point that I want to make. There's a general uh, unwritten programming rule about writing things, not necessarily just applying to variable names, but just anything you write in general. Um, that when you're writing a, say for example, if this is a variable name in this case, you start lowercase and then for any further syllables or words that you want to distinguish, then you would make them capitalize within that. So for example, thunder starts lowercase and then smart starts uppercase. The reason why they do this is because you can't put a space in a variable name. The compiler will treat these as two different strings. It'll get confused and it'll throw an error at your face. Another way of doing this is you can also put underscores in variable names to show that they're separate words, but this is less common. What you'll see most frequently is people doing this, which is the most accepted programming practice. And then of course, uh, we can define the floating point, and if we don't know what it is, we could just simply set it to 0, 0.0 so we could change its value later on. Now I want to try making a logic variable, so we'll go down here, type in bool to tell the compiler that you're defining a logic variable. We'll call this variable logic, and we'll give it a value. By default, if you were just to punctuate the phrase right here, the statement right here, the compiler would set the logic variable equal to false by default. Uh, if you want it to be equal to something else, you could write true, for example, punctuate that there. Now we have a variable called logic that it starts off with a true value. You could also substitute that for false if you'd like, but remember by default they're always set to false. And so now we have 
a whole bunch of variables that are all ready to go. They're not being read anywhere within the program, but we can now reference them from anywhere within task main. This brings me to the final point that I want to make, which is the reason why I de decided to define them within task main. So I want to show you something. If I cut and paste this outside of the main task here, and then I go to compile, it still works. You see, it doesn't do any, it doesn't give me any errors. This is still perfectly functional, it's just not preferred. The reason why is because now these variables are global in scope, they can be referenced anywhere within the program from any task, even one that isn't the main task. Uh, but it's preferred that you define the variables locally where they're going to be used uh, for reasons that I'm going to explain in more detail in a later tutorial where I get into scope into more detail. But just to get you started, uh, generally you want to define your variables within the main task just to keep your program nice and neat and error free. What happens if you choose a data type that's too small and then the value inside that variable accidentally exceeds the data type's limit? This is what's called overflow. What happens in this scenario, if you have an unsigned variable, is that the value resets back to zero and counts up again. If you have a signed variable, the value will roll over to the negative maximum and then count steadily upwards back to zero again. This is usually not a desired effect, so that's why it's important to think about what data type you need to use in order to prevent overflow from occurring. In most situations, it's okay to use the 32-bit long data type because it's plenty large for most applications, but at the same time, 4 bytes is not a lot of memory to sacrifice. Interestingly enough, there's a funny story about overflow that's relevant to us here on YouTube. Back when YouTube was designed, they only used a 32-bit architecture, meaning that the maximum views that any video could obtain before the view counter would overflow was a little over 2 billion. You saw that value before. None of the engineers ever imagined that a video would reach 2 billion views. But in 2014, Gangnam Style actually did just that and caused their view counter to overflow and then roll back around into negative values, which forced Google to move YouTube onto a 64-bit architecture. Thanks to the fact that the maximum value stored inside of variables increases exponentially with respect to the number of bits added, Gangnam Style is now safe for several billion years to come. Thank you for watching my tutorial this week. If you haven't already, click here to check out my new book. It's called Building Smart LEGO Mindstorms EV3 Robots, and it's now available on Amazon. If you found this video helpful, be sure to subscribe to my channel for more tutorials like this every Thursday. And if you have an idea for a tutorial, drop your suggestion in the comments section below. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.